everything starts like just another day. You're out doing errands, taking care of all the things that you normally have to do. It's beginning to get a little late in the afternoon, so you head home with your family. Everything just seems right in the world. You pull into your house, get out, but the clouds are ominous and it looks like a storm is coming. Then the rain comes. You're working on your homework and then all of a sudden, Hey, is anybody else seeing this? I think it's time we all go downstairs. There's Mickey! You grab a blanket or a mattress or whatever it is you can pull under you and wait underneath the stairs. If you're responsible for the safety of someone that you care about, perhaps it's your mother, maybe it's your father, maybe it is a grandparent, maybe it is a wife or a girlfriend or somebody else that just means a lot to you and you want to make sure that they're protected and that they don't end up in the situation that we were in, which is essentially put a big blanket over you, put a mattress over you and kind of pray. If you look at the photos, I don't see a good spot where I would feel comfortable riding out some kind of storm. During turbulent times, you step into the fray to protect yourself and those you love. Go to prepare911.com for more information. So I began with a risk assessment. What are the chances that this is going to actually happen in my area? And what other threats might likely happen? Now, some people could say, there could be zombies. Zombies could come out and attack you. And maybe they're right, but I've never seen a zombie in real life. So I don't really have to worry about zombies. The next thing people could say, oh, what about an asteroid? An asteroid might hit the planet. Well, you know what? In a shelter that you can build inside your home, chances are if the asteroid hits anywhere near you, the shock wave is going to wipe out every structure. Doesn't matter if it's a safe room or not. So the chances of me preparing for an asteroid hitting are going to be pretty small. So then the question became is what are the threats that are most likely to happen in my area? And that one threat is the one that you just saw earlier, which is tornadoes. I had one that hit the neighborhood that my boss lived in. So tornadoes and weather related events were really what I was worried about. So I began doing what everybody does, which is going to Google and trying to figure out what I could do in order to protect my family. So first, I came across a whole bunch of websites that sell shelters. Some of them were under the ground shelters and they, these things would cost $100,000. Well, you know what? I'm not made of money. There's no way in hell I can come up with $100,000. We did begin to decide what our budget was gonna be and it needed to be somewhere between $5,000 and $10,000. I know that may sound, sound like a lot. It was a big stretch for us to do it at the time and we did it over a period of two years, which means we broke this out into $2,500 chunks and we did most of the work ourselves. We were hoping to keep the price around $5,000. Little did we know we made some mistakes along the way and that and our 5,000 thing quickly became 10,000 and then it became around $12,000 is what we ended up spending to get the shelter in place that we wanted. We went out and we looked at the FEMA guidelines. We downloaded documents, they'll be in the description below or on the link to the website. You can look at the documents and it talks about you can either have wood reinforced structures or you can have masonry reinforced structures. Every time I think about wood and something happening with wood, maybe that would work for you, but I was not comfortable. So we decided to go 
with masonry blocks. If you'll look, you'll see a whole bunch of structures where there's collapsed masonry walls all over the place. And it looks like masonry construction is just a terrible way to go until you begin looking at the FEMA documents on how to build reinforced masonry walls. And what that essentially involves, so cinder blocks, which is what these walls are constructed out of, we were gonna use the eight by 16 cinder block, which simply has a large hole in the center. So what we realized in reading the FEMA documents is that the way that you strengthen these blocks so that they can withstand very high winds is by you anchor them to the ground with a rebar, a piece of steel rebar, down through the center of the hole, then you fill that void with concrete. And once it cures with that steel rod on the inside, that's what's gonna hold everything together and make the walls super duper strong. We simply decided to fill all the holes in. So we felt like that that was gonna make the structure way stronger. There needed to be reinforcing bands through the concrete, which is we had vertical lines of rebar going down, filled through the holes. We also cut every third or fourth set of blocks. We cut a small channel and then put rebar in those blocks and tied everything all together so that now you had essentially crisscrossed rebar tied together encased in concrete. Next, we came to placement. In the designs that we had seen on the internet, there were some shelters that cost over $100,000 that you had to dig a big hole in your backyard and shove it in there. I live near a lake, so I worry about how deep the water table is down. Therefore, I do not want to dig a big hole in my yard. Also, with the way the homes are placed around my property, I can't dig a big anything without everybody and their brother knowing something big is going on, none of which I wanted to do. Next is I could buy an already constructed steel shelter and place that inside my garage. However, because of the size of the structure, I would not be able to fit at least one of my vehicles in the garage, which was also a complete no-go because the only way you protect vehicles from bad people outside is putting them inside a locked garage. We had a small room that we used that was essentially 13 by 13 is it was underneath the very front part of our house. It was all under grade because that part of the house has a daylight basement. So the very back of the house is above ground. The very front part of the house is below ground. Therefore, we decided to build two walls and put it in the back corner of the house. The most important part of the structure was gonna be the door. If you just had a solid wood door and a tornado actually hit the home, a 200 mile an hour wind could pick up a piece of two by four and sling it straight through a standard wood door. So then we began looking at what we were gonna do in order to secure the door and that's where we came up with the website below. We called them up, we explained what we were doing and found out that they were running a special on a door that had been returned and that we could get it, and I believe it was around $1,900, $1,800. It was a standard door width and height, but it looked like a bank vault door. And so we decided to go with that one. What we did not anticipate is we knew that this door was going to be heavy. We didn't anticipate how heavy the door was going to be. So we knew that there was gonna to have to be special shipping. If you order a door such as this, it will simply come on a semi truck. They'll pull right into your neighborhood. They're gonna look at you and say, okay, get it off, your, get it off our truck. If you were at a normal business with a loading dock, they would back it up to the loading dock. You would drop the little ramp down. You would run the forklift underneath it and take it off. Well, guess what? I don't have a forklift and I don't have a ramp at my house. So we paid for the lift gate service, which caused them to drop the door on the side of the street in our neighborhood. Gave the guy a hundred bucks. We pushed the door up, our, up the driveway and into our garage. The next question was, is because the door was so heavy, we were concerned that we couldn't get it up. Right, with just three of us. Mistake number two and cost me about 18 feet that I had to take out of my storm room because the door hinges 
have to be located on the side that is next to the masonry wall. If the house collapses around you and the door swings out, then the debris that had fallen around the shelter would block you from exiting. So by having the door swing in, it allowed you to open the door after a tornado goes by and then you could dig yourself out and sort of self-rescue. We ended up moving the door from one side to the other side so that we could put the hinges next to the masonry wall. The next thing that we realized is there was about a lip on this door that we now had to do something with. So what we decided was the best idea was to cut a crack inside of our wall. So we cut about one inch into a uh, five inch foundation wall in order to put this lip into the crack and it had to be a perfectly straight line. The way we solved getting the safe from the garage into the basement is we hired a safe moving company from Cabela's. They said it was heavier than some of their safes. They came out with a bunch of uh, plywood and two by fours and they essentially built a track by laying out plywood taking two pallet jacks, one on the front, one on the back, picking the door up off the ground while it was on a dolly, moving it onto one sheet of, moving it onto one stack of plywood, then picking up the, the back stack of plywood and leapfrogging it over and placing it in front. It took them about half a day in order to move this safe of what ended up being about 120 feet. Was able to stand the door up we filled the cracks full of epoxy. We shoved the door into the crack. Then we used the hammer drill, drilled the holes in it to stabilize it, put anchors into the masonry wall. Then we screwed everything into place and now this door is never, ever, ever going anywhere. That was the installation of the door and the big mistake. Again, the project ran us about $12,000. About the extra $2,000 was part of it was because of fiascos like this that we had to do and others was the engineering that we didn't realize that we were gonna have to do we thought we could simply go off the FEMA designs until we started talking to people about building the roof having a engineer come out look at what we were doing and design a roof for us it's gonna be reinforced with rebar so he said so what are you trying to build it for and I said well you see the big SUV in my neighbor's yard if we had a tornado and that thing was flung up in the air about 20 feet and then dropped on top of the shelter people I care about and myself are gonna be in the shelter and I want all of us to walk away from this unscathed to which he said well in addition to the rebar and eight inches of concrete roof that we're going to put on it. We're going to need to put a reinforcing beam on the inside. Then he asked, well, how many beams? Do you, you just want one beam, right? And I said, no, I think I want to. Would increase six or nine times the amount of impact weight that it could take on top of it. So he drew us up the schematic and put it all together for us. We built up the walls. We bought the beams we had fabricated at a metal fabrication facility and then we went over and all of this work I did out of my Honda Pilot. We didn't rent any vehicles to go pick this stuff up. We moved it all in our Pilot. If I was ever going to do this again that I just ordered all the concrete and all the rebar and all of it and all the masonry blocks from Home Depot and had it show up and have them drop it in my garage. That's what I should have done. Once that was built up and the door was in, then it was time to have the roof put on. So we found a paving company that pours driveways. The guy came out to do the estimate and his exact words is, this estimate has a pain in the ass factor to it. But it wasn't enough concrete in order to have a big truck show up. And even if it did, the concrete would have to be offloaded into the front of the house, then moved by wheelbarrow into the back of the house. And if you take more time than what is allotted, they will start charging you for how long the truck sits there. So I went and rented concrete mixer, bought all the concrete, had it set in my garage. They showed up, they mixed the concrete in the concrete mixer, and then they had a couple day laborers 
who carried in five gallon buckets in through our house all the way back into this room and dumped all of this concrete. So now once we get all of that done, the door's in, the walls are in, the rebar's in, the roof is on, the interior supports are done. Now it just looks like a great concrete box. That is how we built our storm room. Part two of the video, you're going to see the way it looks today. I'm going to walk you through and give you a tour of the entire structure so that you're going to see the finished product. It was certainly a learning experience. I want to thank you for watching the video and I hope you watch part two that shows the actual structure today and all the stuff in it. Go to prepare911.com if you want more information.